Hi, I'm Miriam, and I'm always having a hard time figuring out what to say about myself. So let's start with some facts. I'm a software developer working on the front end. I currently work at a remote company called Brighter, where we build a non-code editor to enable others to build decision automation, which is pretty cool. And now two completely random facts about me. I once built as a really simple exercise, a chatbot that just posts funny stuff in Slack. And now LinkedIn recruiters think I would make an awesome senior chatbot consultant. Also, potato chips will always be my comfort food, food of choice. No chocolate for me. Okay, for real. Um, there's one thing you need to know about me, at least for today. When I got in touch with automated software testing, I fell in love at the first test. When I started my job at Brighter, it took about, I think, a week until a coworker started choking that he would write more tests now that, since I'm here because he was afraid I would judge him for writing not enough tests. And honestly, I think he was only half choking. People have said about me I would get way too excited talking about testing, but I don't think that's possible. And today I want to share them of that excitement and love for testing with you. In this talk, I will give you a broad view on a topic that in itself is big already. I created this roadmap we will follow, so you have an outline which topics I'm going to talk about. And we already checked the Hello World part. This talk is based on a project I worked at at my former job. I can't tell you too much about it and the A and stuff, but it's basically a big B2B shop for ebooks and e audiobooks. The first commit in the front end was in September 2015. When I started to work on the project, it was already three years old, which is not that old, but front end years are a bit like dog years, in my opinion, so it was kind of old in that way. On the 23 March 2018, and I will tell you later why this date is important, we had roughly 40,000 lines of code, 290 JavaScript files, and almost 240 React components. We had an end-to-end -end test suite based on Selenium written in PyTest. This test ran two times a day at that time. We had roughly 900 tests, and that's an okay number. Looking at integration and unit tests, this number looked a bit different, though. And different in that case meant null, nada, nil. How does that happen? So it happened what happens with a lot, a lot of software projects. It kind of grew historically. So the work in front end has changed so much over the past few years. So much logic moved into the front end and the complexity grew immensely. What means the need to have tests there, of course, grew too. But the naturalness with which we actually do write tests in front end didn't grow as fast. At least that's my op opinion and my impression. So in front end, we will often encounter the problem my team and I faced at that point in time. Legacy front end code running in production that needs to be not only maintained, but also extended. And you might think, okay, Miriam, is legacy code really the right word to choose here? So when I started in development, I thought legacy code, that's code that is really old and it's bad. And of course it's written by someone else. It's a kind of code where you open your editor and it's, you decide, you say nobody touched nothing. But Michael Feathers wrote in a book, legacy code is every code without tests, no matter how old it is and no matter who wrote it. I really like the definition because I think it shows how important tests are. So the state of our code was, it worked. In production, people could use it, the client generated money out of it and everything. But adding new features got more difficult. While adding new features, we caused more and more unpredictable bugs. And that meant our confidence changing the existing code got less and less. So what is the solution? What do you do if you identify that kind of red flag? That's easy to answer for me. You write tests. And okay, I gotta be honest. When I say this, 
it's probably not the best argument ever because writing tests is the answer for a lot of things to me. Sometimes I even write tests when I'm stressed. But there are objectively good reasons to do that. They apply to new code the same way, so we just take a really quick look here. We want our code to become future-proof. We want to keep extendability, make refactorings easier. We want to reduce bugs long-term, and we want to find bugs because our user finds them. With new projects, these arguments often make total sense for everybody. But existing projects are or can be a different kind of beast, especially if you haven't written most of the code by yourself. In that case, we developer often think we are going to rewrite that anyway. And on on-site conferences, I normally make a little survey here and ask people to hold up their hands if they had had this thought, looking at older code and code they didn't write themselves. And normally, there are a lot of hands in the air. I mean, I think this about my own code all the time. But if we are being honest, it almost never happens. And especially in professional software projects, it would not even make sense to do that because there is existing code. Somebody put in work and thoughts and time to build this. To throw this code away and nothing else is rewriting would mean we are wasting these resources and this time and this money. And it's often not possible anyway because user and clients are dependent on this code. So the goal has to be, we want to add new behavior like features um, to our code and we make sure that the existing behavior, the old code is still working correctly and will do so in the future. So now you have a picture from where we started and now that I thought the best solution would be to add unit and integration tests to our application. From one person on the team thinks we should add tests to really doing it in the end, that's still a way to go. And the first step is you have to sell this to the people that are working with you on that project. The first thing I had to do, I had to sell this to my team. So everyone on my team was a software developer. Of course, they already knew which benefits tests are offering. All I did was basically reminding them of things they already know. And I made starting as easy as possible. I added a test runner. I did all the setup. I wrote, I wrote the first tests. And so they could just start adding tests without any hassle. And now you can see why March 2018 was such an important date. It was the day I did the setup of the test and added the first test actually to our project and committed it on master. And as you can see, based on my commit message, I was very excited about that. And after that, it was easy. I added tests, I encouraged others to do so, and, and don't forget this because it's important, I praised them for doing so. The next to convince is the leader or the leaders in the project. That was an easy thing in my case because we worked in cross-functional teams which decided about technology in the team. So our, our organization structure simply had no person above that we had to ask about permission with tech stuff. And in companies where this is different, I would suggest if it's a technical lead, you can apply the same arguments as you did with a team. A good developer simply knows about the benefit of tests anyway. If it's a lead more on the business side of things, I would suggest you argue the same way you would do with a client. They have, of course, a big interest in the business side. So what does this cost in money and in time? And my opinion here is I'm a software developer. That means I am responsible for the quality of the software I deliver. A test suite is like an editor or an IDE, a tool with which I can reach and maintain that quality. And I don't ask my client or my business lead which IDE I should use. That means I don't ask if I'm allowed to add tests, period. But of course, it's important to act in a way that is responsible in this business kind of way. So we cannot pause or work on the project, take three months and add tests. The goal has to be 
continue working productive on the existing project, building new features and everything while adding these tests. And we will take a deeper look how to do that later. Here I want to recommend a few tools that can help you from the beginning without even adding a test. It was the first thing we did before we started adding actual tests. So if you don't already have one, add a code formatter and LinkedIn for your code. It helps so much. We also started to move our little components that are used over and over again in a separate component library where we could test them in separation. And it really helped us. Two of my colleagues took a few days and invested a lot of work in making our UI tests faster. In the end, instead of two hours, the test suite, uh, test suite took 20 minutes to run, which meant we could run the test way more often. So for example, before I commit, before I deploy. And we also added error tracking to our project, which was pretty interesting because it showed us so much errors and little bugs in our code that we didn't know about. Because clients, don't report every bug. So they have to notice if it's a bug, and the bug has to be annoying enough to take the time to report it. So error tracking can help you learn a lot about your code and the weaknesses of your code. We began the whole deal with tests with a kind of a trial period. I added tests, then others started to add tests here and there. During this time, we talked about testing as a possible approach in our um, in our workflow and our retrospectives very often. In the end, when the decision was made that we want to add tests as a fixed part in our workflow, we defined rules how to do so. We added this to our definition of done and we wrote it down in our team contract. And these rules were, the tests had to be run and be green, of course, before every commit. Also, of course, before every, uh, every build. The tests were part of the code review, which means if you do a code review, you look at the code and then you take a look at the test and you check, okay, does this test cover the most important part of the code? Um, are the tests written in an understandable, readable way? Do the tests add readability and a better understanding to the code itself? And we started to create improvement tickets. That meant if I worked on a part of the code, and I saw, hey, there's a function that could need a refactoring, um, but I don't have the time now and it's not critical. I created a ticket um, for our backlog. So we created a backlog for technical depth, basically. So let's see how far we are on our roadmap. We have set up, everybody is on board, and we define the rules. Now we talk about when do we actually test. It's important to think about this and make a plan. We want to be responsible and an economic sense, and we want we want not to cause any unnecessary costs to our client. We want to make good use of our time. And the first thing I want to mention here, even if it hurts me a bit, is it is okay to leave untested code that works and is not touched untested, at least for now. But from now on, we defined every functionality, everything new, components, helper functions, classes, had to have tests. This rule was the easiest one to follow because I start from the scratch here and adding tests at the beginning with new code is normally easier than to do so after. The next thing is, if there's a bug, the first thing I do is I write a test for that bug. This test will fail, of course, because there's a bug. And only now I fix the bug, the test should turn green. And now I know this bug will not happen unnoticed again. Before I change existing code, either because I want to refactor it or because I want to extend it, I should write tests that make sure that the existing functionality will still work as expected. And last but not least, since we had a technical backlog that we filled, it was easy to use idle times. For example, if I finished something a few hours before the weekend and I didn't want to start something new, I took a look into the backlog, um, choose a little ticket and fixed it. In my current company, some teams have 
a defined day for that kind of thing. So for example, a fixing Friday, which is pretty nice. So now you saw how we decided over the question when we add tests. Let's take a look at how to test. And this is a point that is mostly relevant for existing code because testing new code is way easier and straightforward. So let's say I have a component that takes care to show a list of products. It has no tests. And I should change something here, add a new feature. How do I approach this? Before I touch anything in the code, I first write a test for the existing code and functionality. Even if on first glance I can see, oh, there's something that I can refactor and make better, I start with a test. And that sounds like more work, and yes, sometimes it is, but it is worth it. These kinds of tests lock down the behavior of existing code. They are characterization or pinning tests. They often will be integration tests because I don't want to test single units of code, but the bigger picture. In this case, I want to test that my component shows a product list in the right way. And one method to write this test pretty fast is I can call a function with a specific argument and expect it to return null. The failing test will tell me what the function actually returned. So I can take this value and add it to my assertion. Done. The same goes for components. I can add the right properties and look which DOM elements are actually rendered. And now I can test for the important ones. Snapshot test could make sense here, but not necessarily, because as soon as I start changing stuff to add new features, they will fail all the time. So I don't recommend them really at this point. And what we are doing here is, I like to imagine that I build a little fence around my code. And this fence makes sure that nothing can break out. So existing behavior will still work as expected, even if I now start changing things. These tests are not meant to run, to run for all eternity. They are not good tests because they only test what works under ideal circumstances. And they are written with the thought in mind that everything in this code is okay and works. And I don't really 100% know this right now. Good tests also test edge cases. And I can be sure that, it, that they fail when something goes wrong, even if it's something weird that goes wrong. But this kind of test help us or it helps me to get in a quick feedback loop if I start refactoring now. In my opinion, the goal for a balanced test suite should be to have a broad base with a lot of unit or unit-like tests. Integration tests and even more end-to-end -end tests are really important for a project, but they are also slower and they tend to be more brittle. Small local tests, on the other hand, make sure that a small part of my code works almost perfectly. If the test fails, it shows me where the problem is pretty clear, so fixing is easy and fast. And because of that, I should take the time now or a bit later to refactor my code and my tests and add the new functionality after that. Refactoring tests is really important. And to add a new functionality, what I do is I start with a test for it. And now I try to work in a test-driven way. So I write a test that fails. I add as much code as is needed to make this test pass and refactor probably testing code. And after that, I write the next text, uh, test for the next functionality I want to implement. And yeah, I know that's not always possible, but I try to follow this approach as often as I can. So my team and I had a lot of learnings during that time. And I want to share the three that are, at least in my opinion, the most important ones. So if I have to add new functionality, to my code, but I don't have time to build my test fence first. And let's be honest, that will happen. I should try to separate the new code, except for a few interfaces, from the old code and test the new code really good. The best case is I also add tests in the old code to make sure that the interfaces are working and that my new code is connected correctly. This is not the ideal approach, but it is way better than to add more untested code in my project. A good way to separate code is to take as many logic as possible out of my components. 
write logic and helper functions or in classes in poor JavaScript or TypeScript, of course, and then test this. Writing tests for poor JavaScript is easier, it's more effective, and it's way more fun. So I don't have to render components, use fake outs, like shadow rendering, and so on. It's an approach I follow with a new project too. Don't add logic in components that is not needed directly for state or prop handling. In React, we used to talk about dump or stateless components that changed a bit with hooks, I know. And they tend to be more stable and easier to test in stateful components. So if I have to add a few to an existing untested component, and I don't have the time to test the existing component good enough, it can help to add a new stateless dump component to handle only this view. Now I can uh, test this component, and in the already existing component, I make sure that my new component is rendered and that all write props are passed. And please note, this is still a solution that is not good, but it's not as bad as it could be. The goal in my mind should always be also to test old code. My next learning or our next learning was, in my opinion, with untested code, it is more important to get it testable than to encapsulate it in the right way. For example, if I have a component that is wrapped in a higher order component, I prefer to export it separately to test it in separation. It's okay to expose the methods that actually should be private to test it. The same goes for helper functions that are used internally in a module. It is not a good pattern for new, for new code. So exposing and therefore kind of creating code just to test it. But in the case of existing code, it is more important to reach a better testability. I can always refactor that later. And last but not least, and maybe the most important thing is, you will not reach a perfect test suite here. You will not reach a high coverage easily. And that is not a reason not to start adding tests because 10% coverage is not good, but it's better than null. It's not as good as 17, but it's a start and you have to start somewhere. So most of the time I talk with other devs about this endeavor, one question comes up, was it worth it? And I will be honest, in the beginning, we oftentimes had the feeling of fighting against windmills. So, or maybe try to put out a forest fire with watering canes. So what does this one tested component help me if there are 237 components left that are untested? I'm not sure if you can see it, but one of these balls in the pit has a green check mark. And this is how lost this one tested component must have felt in our code. So we started pretty cautiously. So it was like, go on the code, look around, not sure where to start, which tests could be useful, and we felt a bit lost. But the more tests, especially unit tests, we had, the more confident we got with this area of the code. And we could more, more and more often switch from a fear-driven development um, to a more curiosity-driven development and curiosity driven test development. So let's poke in here and see what happens instead of fearfully watching what will go wrong. It didn't feel as random anymore. The refactoring has got easier and adding new functionality felt way safer and faster. And then at some point people in my team reached some more, than, more often than others something I would like to call the Miriam state of testing. And that is a point where it starts to be fun. So the confidence to change and add and also remove things in tested code areas grows. And now I don't have to be afraid to destroy something important. I can build new stuff, make old code better, and don't have to reload my browser over and over again to make sure nothing important breaks. And the first test, uh, the first time I refactored a component that had a really good test coverage, it felt like cutting through butter with a hot knife. It's just awesome. So yeah, it was totally worth it. And we started this whole project, writing tests, adding tests in the summer. 
And at the end of the same year, the team got split up and started working on two new projects for the same client. So the project where we started the testing was retired in maintain mode. And in this roughly six months, we grew our unit and integration test coverage from null to 30% which is not the world, but it already helped a lot. In the new projects we started, we started with test right in the beginning and everyone noticed how much more stable the code got and how much easier it was to add, remove or refactor code and add features with a really high confidence. And just for this experience, it was so worth it putting the effort we did in the old project. And that's it. You can find me on social media. You see the links here. And I love to talk about tests. So feel free to add me up.